All right, hi everyone. Hi, thank you for coming today. Um, welcome to Politics and Prose. Uh, my name is Lily, I'm the events coordinator here, and uh, we're now hosting in-person virtual events, along with partnered and supported events and trips and classes. So we got the full works going. Um, and for a full list of everything, you can go to our website, politics prosecom um, So I just have a little bit of housekeeping before we start today. Um, so before I get started, I'd like to ask you to silence your cell phone so as not to disrupt the event. Um, and then when we get time for the opening floor to your questions, we've placed a mic right over there by the pillar. Um, so please line up with the microphone and speak clearly in so that um, we can hear on the audio recording. Um, and then we're also filming today. Um, so later, um, you and your friends will watch it on YouTube, you can see yourself. Um, <laughs> So following the Q&A, we'll have a signing up here at this table. So if you haven't already purchased the book, we've got many copies for sale behind the register. Um, and in the signing line, we'll ask you um, to line by the pillar and we'll ask you your name to be personalized. So just have your books ready uh, for personalization. Um, and then just then once the event is complete, we ask that you fold for chairs, lean them against something sturdy. Um, so that'll help us out a bit and then we'll get to them and pull, uh, put them away. Um, so that's it for housekeeping. So without further ado, um, tonight I'm very excited to welcome Stephen Kearse celebrating the, re the release of his novel, Liquid Snakes. Stephen Kearse is an editor at Spotlight PA and a contributing writer at The Nation where he covers music, uh, movies, and books. His criticism and reporting have been published in The New York Times, The Atlantic, GQ, and Pitchfork, amongst others. Um, his debut novel, In the Heat of the Light, was published in 2019 by Brian Mill Press. Originally from Atlanta, he now lives in Metro Washington, D.C. with his family. Kears will be joining a conversation with Van R. Newkirk. Newkirk is a senior editor at The Atlantic and the host and co-creator of the narrative podcasts Bloodlines and Holy Week. For years, Newkirk has covered voting rights, democracy, and environmental justice with a focus on race and but focus on how race and class shape the countries and world's fundamental structures in print and audio. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming to Politics and Bros, um, Stephen Kearse and Van Arden. All right, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Stephen, for writing the book that we are talking about and uh, for inviting me to moderate this talk. Thanks for liking the book and, you know, joining me. Well, who said I liked it? <laughs> True. <laughs> I'm making assumptions. I loved it. I loved it. It's a very good book. Um, I especially enjoyed it because I believe it's the very first novel that I've read that talks about Four Loco. Tell me about that. <laughs> Yes, Four Loco, um, you know, a very 2009 um, epidemic, um, uh, some people might describe it that way, that, you know, really had uh, a lot of talking heads up in a frenzy because, um, you know, people drank Four Loco and you really couldn't predict what they were going to do next. It was a uh, uh, alcohol, it was a caffeinated, like, alcohol? I mean, it's a fun time. Yeah, maybe that's a good way to think about it. So can you just give us the elevator version of uh, what Liquid Snakes is about? Yes. Liquid Snakes is about a grieving biochemist and coffee shop owner who sets out to get revenge against a company that poisoned his family. Tell us about your main character. Kenny and Ebony and Retta. Yeah, so Kenny is a coffee shop owner. He's a really, um, he's kind of like a, a trickster kind of figure, um, kind of funny, kind of elusive, um, has uh, very strange thoughts, but he's also very elaborate, kind of secretive. Um, Ebony and Retta are two CDC investigators. They're investigating the, the things that Kenny is catalyzing in his like secret coffee shop and they um you know they're they're kind of they're cdc investigators they're they're a part of the epidemic intelligence service which is a part of the the cdc they investigate emergent public health threats so things that are kind of 
flashy, but also things that are really mundane. So, you know, there were EIS people, um, you know, looking into COVID, uh, influenza outbreaks, uh, four loco, um, <laughs> et cetera. Kenny is a really interesting character for me. I found myself trying to sort of trace his literary genealogy a lot when I was reading the story. Feels like there's a little bit of Ralph Ellison in there, a little bit of Atlanta, the, the TV show in there. Uh, can you tell us about the conceptual, the, the, how you came up with this character and what influenced you? Yeah, so definitely Ralph Ellison. When I was in college, my uh, my senior thesis was based on Invisible Man. So that's a book that's just really embedded in my consciousness. But more specifically, um, Victor Laval's Big Machine. Ah, okay, um, okay. That was a big influence. Um, and then Paul Beatty, um, his book, uh, The White Boy Shuffle, and his book, The Sellout. Just the way those characters were just, just very mouthy mm -hmm. and very, um, very nerdy, but still very recognizable, still like kind of hood, kind of down to earth. And I mean, and, and then just rap, you yeah. know, just <laughs> citing all of rap. Um, like just the kind of motor mouth, um, but very calculating, plotting, anxious um, characters that populate rap. Yeah, you, you start the book with a Vince Staples lyric, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's beautiful. That's Thank beautiful. you. Vince Staples is one of the best. The best, my favorite. Um, so tell us also about Ebony and Retta. I, I love their relationship. I think you could have made a convenient choice to, I guess, make them friendlier than <laughs> they are in the book. They do. They have. A, they have friction. They're working together. Uh, how did you conceive of, of of those two characters? Yeah. So I, I have read and am and am, am inspired by lots of noir. So, you know, just partner characters are, are really interesting to me, you know, their dynamics and, you know, in, in noir, partners are, they're coworkers, right? But they're a little more intimate than coworkers, you know, their, their spouses know each other. They go to, to all these different places together. And Ebony and Retta, they also have an age difference. You know, Retta is a, a former physician. She's a part of the EIS. And she's kind of thinking of this as like her career pivot. She's very serious. Ebony is a little more whimsical. She is newly graduated. And even though they have similar education levels, she's just kind of like, hey, I want to like save the world. Um, so there's tension there. You know, you're at work. One person wants to do work. And one person has these kind of loftier goals. Uh, that, that can be very uh, divisive. Now, I'm used to, I think at this point, uh, novels and films that uh, take us in the direction of, uh, let's say, Afrofuturism, science fiction. I'm not so used to taking that and then applying a more Afro-pessimist uh, framework to it, mm -hmm. or, or, or you know, thinking a little bit more critically. Um, I'm curious what your more philosophical influences are here. Yeah, so Fanon, um, for sure, um, author of Black, Black, Black Skin, White Mat. Is it Black? What's it? Is it Black? I, I always get the title mixed up. It's Black Skin, White Mask? Mm -hmm. Yes. Or is it Black Faces, White Mask? It's Black, black skin. skin. Thank it's you. Black skin. Okay. Yes. Um, and Wretched of the Earth. Um, and then just, you know, um, I, I did read some Afro pessimists. Um, you know, it, it's kind of a misunderstood, it, it's kind of a contested term and like field, but you know, uh, Sadia Hartman, mm -hmm. um, I, I was just kind of reading those people, uh, Jared Sexton, and I won't pretend to really understand all the references they've got going on. There's some, there's some it gets very esoteric, but just in terms of them thinking about, you know, mortality and dealing with, with navigating the U.S. and, uh, you know, the, the colonies like the Caribbean as, as black people, those, those influences were at the forefront. And, you know, and also again, just like back to music, um, like Kendrick Lamar, Vince Staples, right. like there's right. a lot of music that's about death, even if it's not explicitly about that, it, it's thinking about it. Um, so 
Yeah, so you know my first job was public health in Atlanta. Mm. Um, wow. I used to, I've used to intern for the CDC. Mm -hmm. So uh, you writing a story that um, takes a lot of the public health subtext of black America and I think puts a science fiction procedural spin on it is was always fascinating to me. Um, for me, I'm, 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 I'm curious about your decision. I don't want to spoil anything for y'all, but uh, Stephen takes some moments that are often referenced now sort of in the environmental injustice canon of uh, stuff that I cover, or that people talk about, that are at the root of a lot of conspiracy theories and makes them the heart of this. I I'm curious, what drove you to make that choice? Yeah, so, you know, I'm in, interested in environmental issues first, and then I just read a lot of, I mean, you, if you read enough, like, Inside Climate News, enough ProPublica, <laughs> enough, um, you know, just like Atlantic or New Yorker stories, there will, you will be surprised by just how much pollution there is um, and, and how far back it goes. And that, that stuff was just kind of on my mind. Um, even, it's, it's funny, I used to live around here and in Spring Valley, you know, there was um, an old like military base and they like buried munitions down there and there's been like cancer, um, uh, higher cancer rates for people in that community. And it's, it's just, a, you know, a very like national issue. But I guess my particular interest in it was, um, you know, just, you know, I know a lot of people with, with asthma. Um, I know a lot of people who, again, a lot of black people who have been really anxious about getting into their 50s and 60s. And you, you might remember this, there was a joke on Twitter a couple of years ago where, um, people were talking about how there could be a, a black Batman because that hypertension would get to him. <laughs> and like the sugar would kill black Batman. Yeah. And like those types of things, <laughs> you know, yeah. Um, yeah. are joked about regularly, but they're really um, like embedded in, in how we talk about like our, our life outcomes and and like what we should do and, and wellness and all these things. One of the things that really delighted me about the book is it is suffused with a lot of really biting humor. It is, it's a funny book, but it's also like a, a really black humor. <laughs> um, I, I saw some, I think the parallels that I was making were to the show Atlanta, mm -hmm. but it kind of occurred to me that maybe instead of drawing from Atlanta the show, you and the creators of Atlanta are just drawing from the strange surrealness of Atlanta, the real city. Yeah, um, I'm an Atlanta native. I've been in DC for going on a decade, um, but I'm still really tied to my hometown. And you know, when I just think about just weird things that have happened um, and how common they were, it's, it, it just feels really embedded in me. Just, um, you know, Atlanta, city of the south and it has this tension between southern traditions and um, this kind of cosmopolitan businessy uh, aura it wants to give off you know we're we're the city too busy to hate we're very sophisticated you know things things of the past aren't a problem here but then you're like navigating it you know whether you're like at a chick-fil-a or something and there's like a weird gender or like race divide in the inside the chick-fil-a um, and that, that stuff, it just kind of adds up. And um, I just, I don't know, laughter is just so relieving, you mm -hmm. know, sometimes when you're dealing with very stressful and very absurd things, especially, you know, coming um, after or during the Obama presidency, there's all this talk of things being post-racial, um, us having overcome things, and then you're you're in the world, and you're like, no, <laughs> you know this. Like I'm reading something from like 1960, and I'm like, oh, this this is relevant to my life. Like, how far have we come? So I think things like that, that absurdity, um, it's just I don't want to say it's embedded in me because not not everyone I know is funny, you know, um, but it's something that I find kind of like binds us, uh, especially when. You have that moment where you kind of have that like conspiratorial look at someone like, did you see that? 
um, and yeah. you can yeah. both kind of escape the, the silliness of it. So the book starts with, I think, a really just a, another fascinating choice to me. You start the book with a uh, end user agreement. <laughs> you start the book with, and, and like, I kid you not, um, I had this, I had it on PDF first, and I saw this, uh, the, 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 the agreement, and like literally just skipped it automatically. <laughs> and I went back and I was like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to read that. <laughs> Was that the reaction you wanted from readers? Yeah, because it's like, I mean, we all, we all like sign things. We all kind of like scroll to the bottom, like, you know, I want to sign up for my Netflix account or whatever. But, you know, we don't really know what's in there. And then I just thought it, I, that's funny. That's one of the last things I added to the book. Mm. Um, but I just thought it was, um, it, it matched Kenny's kind of secrecy, but, also, like he, he's he's kind of like putting himself out there like all the time, right? He's like a very um, like raw, um, emotional kind of person, even though he like seems poised. And I thought that that was like an example of that. And then again, um, I just thought it was a little funny. It so it, funny. It, it, yeah, it, it was. It was funny. Yeah, it. Um, you scroll down, things look. Uh, it, it looked to me it was going like it was a regular. Uh, agreement, and then you know you see stuff like legalese is designed to overwhelm you in the in the in the the fine print there. So it's it's funny. Um, I've known you and your writing. I had to look this up for six years, for seven years, uh, because uh, you were freelancing and you wrote for seven scribes about uh shout out seven scribes seven scribes the the quantum physics of blackness i remember this um we were talking backstage about your journey in history as a writer in those seven years uh what what have you learned uh i've learned that i don't know that much honestly um and I think that's improved my research skills. Um, hopefully no one is reading anything I wrote and thinks he doesn't know that much. But I think um, the main thing is there's just so many like worlds of information and when you really kind of give yourself to your your ignorance or your or your curiosity, you can like discover lots of things. And this story was kind of a uh, like, like a return to something that I used to be very interested in, uh, specifically chemistry. Um, I was telling Van backstage that I used to be a chemistry major, and you know I gave that up because I was like, why am I doing this? I didn't really have any purpose. It was like a first semester of college type of thing, but uh, it was something that still stuck with me. And you know through this book, I was able to revisit lots of my influences, like, you know books that. I read and I was like, oh, I really like the style, but I didn't really get the content or the story. Um, and then, you know, once I had written more, you know, when you write, I, mean, I know you can relate to this, you you read differently. Right. Um, you're more aware of what other authors are doing. You're more aware of what you want to do or maybe what you can't do. And, um, you know, in those seven years, I, I think I just have a greater appreciation for, you know, words like bringing us together and words showing us where we aren't, you know? So you did return to your chemistry roots, I think, in a real way in this book. But I'm also curious about uh, how much research, other than that, it took. Th this took a lot of research, I imagine. Yeah, you know, I'm. I kind of, um, I kind of like double dip. So I, I review movies and music and films, and I also report. And sometimes when I'm working on one assignment, I'm kind of stashing away a thought. Sometimes. Um, when something's being edited, it's like, this doesn't really belong here. Um, but I'm like, you know, I want to explore this. Um, but yeah, I, I think the, the science, just because I want to, to have the reader feel immersed in the, the story, the science was something I really focused on. But you're right, I, was, I had a Google alert, which this is kind of wild. I had a Google alert for public health for like two years. Wow. Um, yeah, it was, it was really dinging during the pandemic. Um, but it's like, I was astounded by just the things that would come in, um, that would be adjacent or like seemingly tangential to public health, but 
but still kind of go on to inform my writing. You, one of the things that is mentioned early on in the book um, is the story of Africatown. How, mm -hmm. that, how, how did that come to you? Yeah. Um, Africatown is a, it's a suburb of Mobile, um, and it's known both for being the site of the Clotilda, and one of the last slave ships to come to the US, and a site of monumental environmental injustice. Yeah, um, I, I don't remember specifically how that came to me, but just given its, its um, significance and given how it kind of fit into the themes of the book, um, it's something I really want to understand, um, especially since you know, they ended up changing the name. Uh, it's now named Plateau. It's Plateau. Um, and, you know, it's, it's one of those places, th this happens with some things. So there's environmental, like, disasters all over the U.S., but some just take up more bandwidth than others. And for whatever reasons, Africatown was very documented relative to other things. But once you read about Africatown, you start to learn about the, the Spring Valleys and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Baltimore Harbor and, and all these other kind of things that are in plain sight. Um, but I, I'm pretty sure I was just, you know, in that public health um, fishnet, you know, it just kind of came to me. I really thought, so I was reading this book at the exact same time when I was watching They Cloned Tyrone. <laughs> Um, which, if you haven't seen it, is a very good movie, but it also feels like a really good companion to the book. Um, did you like the movie, first of all? I did not you like, didn't like it. You didn't like it. No, but but I'm I'm a critic, so oh, I, feel, I, I don't feel like it. most things. Okay. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I know why you make that comparison. I think stylistically, in terms of like they clone Tyrone, it's you know it's Afrofuturism. It's, um, you know, it, it's music, it's like kind of pastiche, it's like really thinking about how certain um, like media lineages, specifically like black exploitation movies, are still relevant, still interesting for a modern audience. And, I, and I'm thinking about that, like I was really influenced by like 70s new wave sci-fi. Mm -hmm. um, mostly because it was just like, you read that stuff and it's like, I don't understand this, but it's cool. You know, and that's like, that's like a really nice feeling. And I, I think that I can imagine someone were watching They Clone Tyrone and being like, you know, I've never seen Superfly or The Mac or whatever, but still being like really engrossed in it. And I mean, to like really make the parallel, there's like weird science in, in They Clone science. Tyrone. There's yeah. weird science. Yeah. Um, so I want, uh, we're going to go to audience Q&A in a little bit after a couple more questions and a reading from you. So I want you all to start thinking up your wonderful questions. Uh, I've got two more than, than you, can, you can give us. I know what you're going to read, and it's my favorite passage in the book, so I'm glad you picked it. Uh, so now you are two novels into the game. Tell us about where you're heading next. I've got another novel mm -hmm. um, in the pipeline. It's very, it's the, the chemicals haven't even come together yet, not even trying to be punny. Um, maybe the factory doesn't even exist yet, okay. but okay. I want to write another novel. <laughs> um, and then some short stories, I'm going to continue reporting and, and writing criticism. Um, but yeah, it, it's weird. Just having two books down, it's like sometimes I think about it, I'm like, man, Ralph Ellison only wrote two books, you know? Like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to compare myself to Ralph Ellison, but it's just like, it's. You compare yourself to Ralph Ellison. <laughs> oh, man, this is recorded too. It's fine. It? It's fine. <laughs> I, I did it first. Okay. It's fine. Um, but I, I want to, I don't want to get too, I guess, into the sadness of our current political reality, but, you know, we live in it. But I think whenever I'm, read, I'm, re, I'm reading this book and it's, you know, about black oblivion in this real way, it's about people making these choices uh, uh, that really have to do with the death of, of blackness in a real way. And I'm, I'm curious if you feel pressure from people 
I want to move away from the terminology of like of banning books, but you know, banning black thought from schools. Do you feel pressure uh, from that movement to, that, that shapes how you write? I think that that pressure is, you know, it's kind of ambient. It's not coming at me, mm -hmm. but knowing that it's out there, I am thinking about the the spaces in which I'm writing, you know, are there black editors at this place? Are there black staffers? Um, if the audience, like who is the audience? Um, I'm thinking about the longevity of things, you know, if, are they gonna be able to take care of this story? You know, if somebody, if they get angry emails or letters, are they gonna like cave and be like, oh, well, you know. Um, and then it's funny you ask that. I, I was um, at my alma mater last year I did a, um, a presentation on something I reported about um, like unsolved civil rights murders mm. um, and someone asked you know it was for a magazine Oxford American magazine and someone asked you know could your could your story be taught in schools right now based on like recent Georgia laws and the answer was no um, and that concerns me um, and that that definitely that makes me want to seek out those things and at least have a, a, a record on online uh, and in print. But I know it requires more than just the stories being written. You know, it, it requires um, you know organization, um, you know planning, and you know sh deeper criticisms of the stories that are out here. Yeah, it, it strikes me, um, especially as somebody with children uh, who very well could go to schools where they can't read what I write, uh, that the goal isn't necessarily to stop uh, people, the, I mean the authors do get punished, but it's to stop people from becoming you. That's what it feels like the aim is to me. And I guess my last question before I let you read is what, I don't know, what, what, what what makes you a person who is dabble, who is not dabbling, who is now mastering different forms of writing, who is toggling between fiction, between novels, between criticism, between essays and reporting? How do you hold all this in your head? <laughs> um, well, first, lots of coffee. Yeah. And then, you know, it's just one thing about writing in particular is, you know, I don't, I don't like to mystify, right? Like, you know, a lot of work goes into it. Um, it takes cultivation, it takes practice, feedback, openness to, to criticism and things like that. But I guess I just keep being, I, I, I just keep getting engagement from people, you know, whether it's like rooms like this or, you know, someone emailed me the other day and was like, hey, on your website, you said, um, say hi if um, I come to your website. And I was like, well, Someone read that, <laughs> you know, um, and and it's just you know people people want to learn more about the world, um, and you know as someone who, like I was saying earlier, is aware of how much I don't know, I'm I'm happy that writing allows me to make those connections, and you know it like fulfills me personally, um, and I, I think that's what keeps me going. And then it's just like. I'm not comparing myself to Toni Morrison. Okay. 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 I, I just want to. That, that's a bridge too far. <laughs> um, but um, you know, there's that old Toni Morrison quote where she's like, you know, because she, she used to be a, a book editor, um, mm -hmm. and she was like, you know, I edit the books, I write the books, I write the criticism about the books, and it's like when you really kind of are in those creative waters and environments, you you just feel empowered to be curious. To fail sometimes, you, you know, you don't want to see my archives of like things that shouldn't see the light of day. Um, but you know, I still wrote them, um, and knowing that sometimes things connect, or even things might connect, and you know, they kind of resonate. But it's like, oh, I could have gone harder. Um, I don't know. It's just it, it it keeps me going. What do you want people to feel after they read the book? Hmm. I hope it's like. Um, a lot of feelings, you know, some excitement, some irritation, some disturbance, um, and you know, hopefully some. I don't know. I feel like the for me, a, a book is has succeeded when I like 
have to blabber about it to other people. You know, I'm just like putting it in their face. You know, I'm like texting them. I'm like reading a bunch of reviews. I'm going on like YouTube and like commenting on things. I don't really do that, but you know, I, I might look at the comments. Um, and I think that, you know, art that gets you out there, um, I, uh, that's kind of like the metric I use. So ultimately, I believe what you're saying is you want people to buy more copies of the book. Yes. Yes. At, at least yes. five per household. At least household. five. You heard it here first. Five, please. Now, I'm going to give you time to read a passage. It's a passage I actually read it and I hated you when I read it. <laughs> I hate when I read something and it like makes me feel something because I feel manipulated, man. I feel like, yeah, like somebody came and pulled my strings. And I think you will feel that somebody is pulling your strings, but in a delightful way. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. Can you all hear me? OK. All right, so this chapter is titled Black Sublime. Um, it's the name of a coffee shop in the story that is ran by Kenny, one of our main characters. And this is in the beginning of the book. It, the, this chapter comes after weird things have happened. But inside of Black Sublime, it's kind of just another day. So. Kenny's hand hovered above the coffee grounds, a firm grip holding the tiny kettle in place as he traced concentric circles with the heated water. The liquid landed gently below, flowing through the crushed beans and drip dripping into a ceramic mug. As Kenny flicked his wrist up to halt the hot steam and let the water seep, the customer observing him spoke. Are you the owner? She asked in a warm lilt. There was a cheer to her voice that Kenny liked. I am, Kenny said. I've always wanted to ask how you came up with the name. Kenny eyed the timer and scale and resumed pouring. Always, I'm sorry, I've never met you before, Kenny said as the grounds fizzed and gasped, tiny gas bubbles forming and bursting from the boiled water's heat. Baristas called this phenomenon the bloom for the way it swelled and expanded the grounds like petals waking to light. The customer kept watch. Kenny enjoyed the audio more than the visual. This dulled murmur was unbeknownst to the Yelp reviewers and harried commuters who worship his specialty coffee shop. Kenny felt it took place on a private frequency, an intimate channel reserved for the folks who appreciated the brewing process, who knew every cup was a miracle. Tony, ponytailed restaurateurs, and denim aprons were the face of specialty coffee, but the real one's new coffee depended on the tenacity of delicate plants grown in volcanic soil harvested on treacherous hillsides by chapped hands. Cherries dried by a benevolent sun, hauled by a persnickety mill, screened for beauty by hawk-eyed sorters. Enterprising suppliers with links to countries flush with conspicuous consumption and paved roads and stable governments. Roasters that pledge their lives and elbows to scrubbing away chaff and caffeol from the narrow guts of ovens. Cafes in possession of multi-setting grinders routinely purged of grounds. Baristas with bills, kids, egos. The whisper of the bloom was one of the last links in this sprawling Baroque chain. Kenny dumped the grounds in a nearby waste bin and slid the mug to the woman. I'm sorry, Kenny said, meeting her soft gaze. What I meant was, welcome to the shop. The woman smiled. Thank you. I pass by here all the time, she said, letting the mug linger on the counter. I've always been too busy to come in, but Black Sublime is stuck with me. It sounds so peaceful. She lifted the mug with her hands and held the rim right under her nostrils. It smells so peaceful, she added. Kenny grinned. He believed he owed his patrons nothing more than good service and good product, but in two years of business, this woman was the only customer who had approached him with curiosity rather than entitlement. He felt no tractor beam of urgency as he prepared her drink, no self-importance. You ever heard coffee will make you black? Kenny asked. It's a book, right? She said. It is, but it's also just an old black thing. Either to keep caffeine away from kids or to disparage dark skin, black folks would say it. 
My grandma used to say it, and I never knew what to think. But I drank coffee anyway. He paused. This was the friendliest exchange he'd had with a customer since Black Sublime opened. What was she really doing in his tiny Decatur shop on a Thursday afternoon? Did Kingman Coke kill people the old-fashioned way, too? He looked at her closely. Athletic physique. Skin brown as wet bark. Two nose piercings. Neat hair. Modest business attire. Inquisitive, but not prying. Polite and kind. Not quite the contract killer type. Still out of place, though. OK, the woman said, confusion sprouting across her face. Sorry, Kenny said. I'm just appreciating the moment. No one's ever asked. She drank the coffee. Her eyes closed as she sipped. Damn, she whispered. Kenny's eyes dropped to the counter with relief. He hated when he distrusted black people he didn't know. It never felt like a choice. I promise, he said, to finish the story so we can both get back to work. The woman sipped her coffee, then nodded. So I came up with Black Sublime because I thought if coffee makes you black, every cup should put you closer to blackness. It should connect you to black people and history and culture. It should blacken your outlook, your sense of purpose, your love of self and community. He paused again. It was awkward to be so forthright with a stranger, to lust for their approval. It's just coffee, I know, he continued. But that sense of duty and fulfillment, to learn black, to love black, to become black, that's the black sublime. The woman placed her mug on the counter and lightly applauded, her claps echoing through the empty shop. Kenny responded with a sheepish bow. The commissioned portraits of Afini Shakur, Andale Mangatama, and Grace Jones that hung on, the, hung on the shop walls suddenly felt embarrassing. Kenny imagined how the woman might describe him to her group chat. Hotep's finally branching out. Met a nigga today that sells black soap and black coffee. Black Sublime did not sell soap, but Kenny sensed this woman was an accomplished storyteller. Kenny tidied the counter as she resumed drinking. He tried to will himself to continue talking with her, or at least invite her to take a seat rather than stand, but he wanted her to leave. She made him feel too eager. All right, now we want to open up the floor to questions. Let's, uh, let's see. I was wondering about uh, how you conducted the uh, scientific preparation for the book. Do mm -hmm. you have uh, any background in chemistry or science? Do you, do you inter interview scientists or people from the CDC, for example? No, um, but there was a lot of just online resources. A lot of, um, I, read, I read a book on the history of pesticide in the, in the US. That was pretty informative. And then um, you know, material safety data sheets for, for various chemicals. And then the EIS, you know, um, they have a lot of their publications uh, going back for decades available online. So I read through those. They've also done interviews. So I think mostly public facing scientific things were what I read. And, and I had a chemistry textbook. But um, really, my goal with what I learned and what I was interested in was just to, you know, make sure that the science was believable, even though it was often fake science, you know. Um, and I, I, you know, it's funny, I do have some friends that are, uh, that are chemists, but I was, and I, I told myself, you know, when it's all said and done, you know, I'll have them read it. But in the end, I was like, you know what, I want to, you know, just have it be what I, what I made, you know. Mm -hmm. You probably wrote a lot of this book during the COVID pandemic, and I was wondering if that perhaps related to your story in any way. Uh, and given that it's about medical crime, um, what is your uh, opinion about um, uh, the COVID being a bioweapon and also perhaps the uh, vaccine? Um, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm pretty sure COVID was a naturally occurring disease, but I, I don't know. I mean, most evidence points away from the, the lab leak theory, 
from what I understand. Um, but you know, science is open-ended, we'll see. Um, and then I did, as you guessed, write a lot of this during the pandemic, and that was really helpful for the just public health information. Like there were just so many Q and A's with epidemiologists, chemists, um, biologists, virologists, and just being able to hear them talk um, here and, and read the terminology that kind of made it easier for me to like reproduce that in the, in the book. Uh, congratulations, Stephen, on, on publication. Uh, I was very impressed by how well the sci-fi elements that you mentioned were kind of interwoven into the book, and I, I never felt like at any given point that the those sci-fi elements kind of overwhelmed your particular style or voice. Uh, but uh, I did think that you accomplished it quite well, and I, I think also that those elements really paid off at the end of the book, and for me specifically. Thanks. Um, but I was wondering whether or not you see uh, yourself writing more in that genre space, or whether you just see it as more of a tool that you feel confident in using to kind of further your other goals in a particular novel or piece. I think just based on... Um just based on the the churn of music and this kind of idea with albums like that you, you don't want to do something you've already done again mm -hmm. I, I am kind of leaning towards not going to that but really it's just like inspiration is very unplanned it's mm -hmm. it's very random I, I was telling van earlier i wrote a short story last month didn't plan on writing it i had just read another short story collection by um john edgar weidman really talented writer and it just blew, one story just blew my mind. I was like, I gotta write. And, this, and that story had nothing to do with science fiction. Mm -hmm. But um, I think consciously, especially like once you have one or two books, you're more aware of your habits, you know? Um, and I don't wanna get caught in the spiral of either responding to my habits or trying to like pivot away from my habits. So I can't say, but I wouldn't, count it out. I love science fiction. I love speculative fiction. And it, it really just depends on the story, I think. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Got time for a couple more? Congrats, Stephen, on your Thanks. book. Um, I know you talked about your love for noir and partners and whatnot, and I I love like that trope too, and like the dialogue between characters. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if you could talk about some of some characters, character dialogue that you really liked, and mm -hmm. if any of those like that you liked inspired your writing between the partners in your book. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know what's funny? I'm gonna like I mentioned noir, but I'm just gonna mention a bunch of movies because right. I'm kind of like a, a film head. Um, but, you know, Pulp Fiction, John uh. Travolta and Samuel Jackson, their conversations, really funny. There's a, there's a reference to Pulp Fiction in this. Um, and then Die Hard, <laughs> um, Bruce Willis and um, the uh, Reginald, Reginald, I forget his last name, but the, the, uh. the dad from Family Matters. Yeah. 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 yeah, Lavelle Johnson. Or, Reginald Bell Johnson. Yes, thank you. True. Um, and then I think I also had True Detective in mind a little bit, even though they don't, they don't really get into the banter. Oh, you know what? Lethal Weapon. Uh, um, Lethal. Yeah, so just the idea of just having to be really close to someone that uh -huh. understands you, but you really hate them. Um, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> you know, um, I think that, that there's just a lot of things you could play with in there. And even... Um, I would even cite the Boondocks, you know, mm. Riley and Huey. Huey yeah. Um, they're they're not coworkers, but there's a similar kind of like we are so different, but we are like in the same house. Exactly. And, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Reactions? Manifestos? All right. Uh, I have a question that we sort of touched on a few times, but not directly. Um, as far as style goes, 
you're pretty prolific in two very different kinds of writing, reporting and and the and the kind of lyric fiction that you just read or can feel two worlds apart. I know because I'm a reporter and I <laughs> write and translate poetry. Um, do you ever worry about the two voices, that competing voices in your head kind of infecting each other? Is that ever a, is that ever a problem or is that a strength? Um, I think it's a strength. And I, I think there's more than two um, just because really the voice is always determined by the story. I'm, I'm very much a like form follows function kind of person and there are times where you need to be withdrawn and kind of deadpan. There's times where you need to be more emotional and that's as true of, of fiction as nonfiction. And so I'm, I'm just very aware of that. Um, and I also, you know, th that's what editors are for. Editors are gonna tell you, hey, you've done that before. Hey, you're copying someone else. Hey, this doesn't serve the story even though it, it feels like it's it's you. Um, so I'm, I'm really receptive to that too. I, I thank <laughs> a bunch of editors who didn't even read this in the acknowledgments because just conversations we had about other things I was writing, they were very clarifying. I could, I could see my habits. And I, I think that was very useful. Can I ask another question? Mm -hmm. Hi, you mentioned that you were a chemistry major in your first semester. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you had some kind of epiphany to switch to uh, liberal arts and if your parents were upset about <laughs> it. <laughs> um, I, it was just one, I had a very influential conversation. So at my school, um, which is Mercer University, we had a, everyone in the liberal arts school had to take a first year seminar and it was like a mix of writing and history and kind of like university lore, honestly. <laughs> and um, my professor, like it, all the liberal arts professors, if I recall correctly, taught that seminar, but my professor was an English professor and so he was like very heavy on writing and instruction and literature and one day he was talking to me he was like why are you an English major and I didn't have a good answer or why are you a chemistry major and I, I didn't have a good answer for him it was just like well you know I want to be pre-med you know um, which a lot of, a lot of people go to college <laughs> and it's just like well it's like you just recognize doctor as a job you can do so you're like, oh yeah, I'll do that. I'll be a dentist, whatever. Um, and then I, I, I feel really fortunate that my professor was like, well, you know, you have to like, like shadow doctors. He like really laid out the process, and I was like, damn, I don't really want to do all that. Um, <laughs> and he was like, well, why don't you be an English major? Um, and that kind of, once I was in it, I was like, okay, I, I like books. I already liked books, but he would, um, he would not be happy to hear what my favorite book was. Then my favorite book when I was 18 was Jurassic Park. Great book That's though. A good book. Good Still book. stand by it. I took the long route, I shadowed the physicians. Mm -hmm. Four years pre-med. Whoa, yeah. wow, you yeah. were committed. Yeah, yeah, didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> but it did though. Oh, I suppose. Uh, I'll do last call on questions and then you can get to signing these wonderful books. I'm going to squeeze in with a question. You mentioned right. your favorite book back then. Mm -hmm. Do you have a couple books that you recommend right now that you've been really into? Ah, um, I've, I've kind of been on a tear uh, recently. I think I would want to shout out The Factory by Hiroko Oyamada. Um, she's a Japanese author. The Factory was translated a few years ago. I usually read a book and then like five years later I come back to it and, and see whether I was you know wrong back then or um, you know I just feel validated I read I've read that book since I got it in 2019 I read it like three times um, it's just so good and the the prose is just wild I, I, I'm really reactive or responsive to style like when you read something you're like no one else could have written this that is just that just hits but it's also the the ideas um, but I've also been reading lots of manga recently. Tokyo Ghoul, very underrated. If you've seen the, the anime, it's not representative of what the manga is doing. Um, and, and Paul Beatty. Paul Beatty is like the person I'm chasing. I read, I read his books and I'm just like, man, I, I, I didn't know sentences could do that. It's like he's playing basketball and jump roping and, and like doing slam poetry at the same time. It's, it's just very ambitious, but it's also just very grounded um so 
he's he's someone I want to chase. I think he has a book out later this year called like Sunshine Negro Sunshine or something like that. Mm, I gotta check the calendar. I'm excited about it. Yeah. Um, so I think those would be the the books I would shout out. But there's so many more, you know. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us and for your wonderful questions. And thank you, Stephen, for writing Liquid Snakes. Thanks for.